Okay. Okay. It says that we are recording now, so I guess we should go ahead and get started. Excellent. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Mark Anderson with the Chattanooga Writers Guild, and this is our monthly program for April 2020, and it is National Poetry Month. And tonight, our speaker is a uh, former president of Chattanooga Writers Guild and longtime friend of the Guild, John C. Minone. And his poems uh, has poems appearing and accepted in the 2020 Antarctic Poetry Exhibition, North Dakota Quarterly, The Mentor, Blue Fifth Review, Poetry South, Baltimore Review, and others. His poetry won Im the impressions of Appalachia Creative Arts Contrast 2020. He has award was awarded a Gene Ritchie Fellowship 2017 in Appalachian Literature and served as celebrity judge for the National Federation of State Poetry Societies 2018. His latest three collections, Flex Lines, the Intersection of Science, Love and Poetry is forthcoming in Lynette's Wings, Lynette's Wings Press 2020. He edits poetry for Abyss and Apex and other journals. A retired physics professor, he lives near Knoxville, Tennessee. And he, we can find more about him at his uh, blog, J.C. Manone dot wordpress.com that's his name is spelt m-a-n-n-o-n-e j.c manoni <clears throat> welcome john it's good to try this is our first experiment with uh with the current state of affairs we're doing a, a, a zoom interview and we're just hoping for the best reception we can welcome and let's uh how should we get started tonight how are you doing tonight? thank you mark it's great to be here and happy easter to you and everyone who's listening yeah here we go well i know uh you're well respected in our in the writers guild as a almost a poet laureate of the guild and uh so i think we're all we're going to learn something tonight I want to know, start out by asking you why you love poetry, how you chose poetry. I mean, you could have written in other things, but usually there's something that gets us going to where we actually love poetry. And then I want to ask you after that for some examples of why, uh, let us taste some of the poetry that you would consider worth tasting. Okay. That's a good question. Uh, Mark, um, I've thought about it and asked myself, why poetry? Why not some other creative outlet? Why even creative writing at all? Because I basically am a left brain type of guy. I'm a scientist. And uh, I, I get joy out of reading equations, so to speak, uh, as a chemist and a physicist. But something happened, um, and I can't quite put my finger on it, but I'll give you a little bit of um, a background on it. Um, I was teaching uh, an astronomy course for a local community college, and um, I wanted to make the experience for my students um, more than more than good. This would be probably the only science course that they would ever be taking. They're fulfilling their science requirement, and these are non-science majors. So I was looking for profound astronomical events that impacted history, or should I say astronomical events that had a profound impact on history. And when I learned about Paul Revere and his ride and the role of the moon, the late rising nearly full moon, and the incoming tides, which is a, a loony solar effect, uh, definitely astronomy related. That was such a, an important impact that when I uh, learned about this, it was through um, Longfellow's poem, Paul Revere's Ride. And so after the success of that venture, I naturally looked for more of Longfellow's works and saw that he wrote an awful lot about the night. 
And so I naturally became interested in poetry because of that. It could have just as well have been a piece of fiction, but it was a poem. And so that's how I think I stumbled on, on poetry as being um, something that became special to me. Um, but then also on thinking deeper about it, where, where, did, where did this natural desire for poetry even begin? Because I, I think I did very poorly. Well, no, I know I did very poorly in poetry. And, and I guess it was my high school class. And um, I should actually hate it, but I don't. So um, I'm thinking that maybe my mm, being Easter, this is so um, appropriate. I, uh, my, my discovery of my spiritual self my coming to the Christ uh, had me in 97, um, I found myself looking at things very differently. My responses to, to people's birthdays or consolation notes because of a loss all of a sudden became poetic. And I, and I, and I didn't want it to sound like a Hallmark card, but I did want it to sound authentic and very heartfelt. And so um, I think that maybe the genesis of poetry came from things like that um but then there's another thing that i learned when i was 65 some six years ago i discovered after visiting my two sisters that my mother had written poetry in her recipe book and when i discovered this of course i was elated that there's a genetic reason for my uh liking poetry uh sadly however i learned that her work must have been thrown out by mistake uh, when she was moving from her apartment to um to my sister's apartment because she was not well uh and this was a few years before she passed in 2002 so i think those reasons all together are are there's the genetic predisposition there's a spiritual driver and then there's a the coincidental thing with uh, longfellow's work that set me towards poetry that's that's why i like it i think all right your next question that's nice to be able to pinpoint something like that and say oh yeah it was longfellow that kind of introduced me or turned me on to that uh so there's a lot of different kinds of poetry around this world i've been reading some uh british in my class british poetry from the uh oh 16th through present but mostly right now, eight, 19th century. Uh, what do you like? What particular kind of poetry are you drawn to? I mean, is there? Um, I, I like, I have a, fortunately, I have a, a wide range of taste. And I can say that any well crafted poem, and I know that's a subjective thing as well to an extent um i can like i in other words i like formal poetry um i can like it as much as free verse uh or open verse perhaps is a better word word um but um i can probably think of examples of what i don't like better than what i do like i don't like language poetry i think it's an oxymoron to call it poetry um but it, it, it was derived just to be just to be oppositional just just to show that poetry is not this emotional thing it's it's something that's rather sterile and contrived and i don't buy any of that nonsense i, I want to interrupt you explain i'm not sure what you mean by language poetry what is that 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 <laughs> it's actually it's actually it's actually spelled language but in between each letter you'll see an equal sign so it's a, it's a weird spelling. Again, that, that's probably a, um, a rebellion in spelling of the word itself, language. Um, it's, it's, it's a postmodern construction, a postmodern idea, uh, as opposed to contemporary, postmodern as a, a period or movement of poetry. You had the modern poets, and, and these are the postmodern ones, which, okay. which, which is contemp under the contemporary but not all contemporary poetry is language poetry. And I don't know much about it because I don't like it. It's like, you know, I, I want to study the real thing instead of a counterfeit. So I don't know that much about it. But from what I've seen, it's, it doesn't make much sense. And it's not supposed to make much sense. 
And I'm, that's exactly the opposite of what a poem is supposed to do. It's supposed to engage not only your intellect, but your heart, and probably your heart first, or your intellect second. Mm -hmm. um, so, point. yeah. So anyway. <laughs> but, but there is something, uh, I mean, there's a lot of art that affects our heart, but poetry seems one to be one of those things that can also fascinate our mind because we're looking at intricacies or word patterns or the way things are said. I mean, what do you think about old school things like rhyme and meter? Ah, excellent. Um, I, I, there's got a lot of merit uh, and I admire the old masters who really had it down. And, and, and speaking of that influential person, Longfellow himself, even though I don't write in his style at all, he's been a, a great impact on me. He's the one who actually brought the, the culture of poetry uh, uh, to this country. It was, it was already big in England, but not quite so big over here yet. But, um, but he, he was successful. In fact, his, his bust, is, his, the bust of Longfellow is over at, at um, uh, uh, what's it called, Winston Abbey? over in England next to uh, Tennyson, <laughs> you know, so anyway, um, so uh, I, I bring up Longfellow because he was a master of meter. I'll give you an example, um, Paul Revere's ride. He wrote that poem in anapestic tetrameter. All right, so that's da-da-doom, that's an anapest. Da-da-doom, you know, four of them, da-da-doom, da-da-doom, da-da-doom simulates the gallop of a horse. How appropriate for the poem to be able to take meter and and have that extra literary depth, so to speak, here a sonic one that uh, that just really brings the poem even more alive. Uh, so, so Longfellow thought meter was extremely important. In fact, he even went, he studied his job, his job was mostly where he got money was actually translating grammar books into Italian and into Spanish. Um, and so he was a big linguist type of guy as well. So he traveled to various places in Europe. And when he, I think it was Finland, and with their language that gave him the, the cadence and rhythm for the Song of Hiawatha, uh, at least from what he had written in letters to everybody, he would write to his father almost every day and to his friends as, as he was able. And, and half of his letters are actually, they exist and they're, and they're stored in libraries. And so that's how I learned about Longfellow a lot. I researched them because he had such an impact on me. Um, but anyway, to answer your question, yes, I do like rhyme, but it's not, it's often not done well, so I don't I don't care for a lot of the rhyme that I read. It's it sounds forced, and um, so how do I get around it? How do I still like? It? Because when I when I started writing in in May of '04, that's the only thing I knew was rhyming poetry, um, and so that's the way I would write until I learned about the free verse. Um, and I got my fix, so to speak, by realizing that the rhymes can happen internally, not just on the ends of lines. And so uh, that, that, that was liberating for me because I could still get all that wonderful music that I desire, that I think is important. But the music can come in different ways. It doesn't have to come with end rhyme. So... But just to prove that I still can do and rhyme, I still, I do it on occasion. Um, yeah. And I don't mean to be silly, because it's easy to be silly, but to write a serious piece of work, how, do, how would I write a rhyming poem today? Because I do like rhyme. Um, I, would, I, would, I would make the rhymes softer. They would be, they're, they're called slant rhymes or half rhymes or some other word like that, where instead of it being a hard rhyme, like, like man and can would be hard rhymes, but, but, but men and can would be a soft rhyme, but just maybe the, the consonants would rhyme, or maybe the, the alliterative, alliteratively 
rhyme or some there's some yeah. there's some sonic in there that echoes the sound and so that combined with not having end stop lines or not many of them it, get, it lets lets me lets me feel okay about about a rhyming a rhyming poem and one of the best compliments i ever got was um was it a critique group at cwg as a matter of fact um um the uh, the old christian writers market group is where it happened um was the the one listener said after he after i told him it was my one of my rare rhyming poems he says i didn't know that was a rhyming poem <laughs> that's music to my ears <laughs> to, to be so soft handed about about the end rhyme that that you don't notice it unless somebody points it out to you or you notice it late in the game so anyway Okay, so, yeah, thanks. That's, hopefully that answers the question. That's helpful. And as it's been said that uh, the form should serve the art rather than have the art serve the form. Uh, but why don't you give us some exa an example of something that you would consider something you really enjoy? You have some examples of your own work there? Yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I do. And um, in fact, I'd like to start off with um, sharing a little one, and, and I think I can do this with sharing too, so you'll be able to see it. I'm looking for the document. Um, don't panic. Well, if you want, you can just read it to us. We'll just hear it. No, what I what I can do is hit share, and you'll hear it and see it. Okay. Share screen, and uh, I think this is the one. And if I just move it, then you'll all be able to see it. It's called standing up. Standing up, and this is an example of of the the, the little backstory behind this. I was reading some science news, and that inspired this poem. And it's a short, non-rhyming poem. Okay, this is a free verse, but um, this is this is published in uh, Nadwa um, um, Poetry and Translation. And standing up. When I was able to stand on my own two feet, which some say happened seven million years ago when the stars exploded, flashed our atmosphere with lightning and burned our trees, even the ones in the garden leaving grasses, I stood straight up on my haunches, not to avoid the lion or to carry something special like my food or to accept express any prowess against my enemy or competing males, but rather to dance, to dance under the stars and hold your hand. Wow, standing up. That's interesting to take all that science background, all of that, I mean, that's anthropology to the core, and, uh, and yet put it in a different context and, and a totally different, I mean, that's kind of an interesting background, but it means much more than that. Yeah. I'm trying to get your image back on here. I don't know what to do. When I was able to stand on my own two feet, which some say happened when sometimes I look at the beginning of the lines and see patterns there, when, which, when, with, there's four lines in a row that start with those what sounds. Yeah. I wouldn't even notice that, but it's it's there. Yeah, I didn't notice it. Uh, I'm much more conscious on the, how the line ends than I am on how the line be, the begin the word beginning the line. If I have to put a weak word anywhere, I would rather. And those are the two choices. I'd rather put it in the front of the line than at the end of the line. Like. Like ending a ending a line on a on a on an article or a conjunction or a preposition. Though the latter, there are some cases where ending the line on a preposition can be effective. But generally, generally, I, I try to avoid that if I can. Then we look at some of the words down the middle. There we have happened, exploded, burned, leaving grasses, garden leaving grasses, haunches, enemy, and then ending with dance. And hold your hand. Yeah, the the idea of holding hands is 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 um is a thesis or a, 
or um, a recurrent theme in some of my work that on a poem before this one called um, And Then It Rained uh, was looking at humankind in the beginning and when sex was probably nothing more than just procreation, the realization of sensuality, when did that come into the picture? And I think, I would guess, I don't know, I'm just doing my poetic thinking. I would think that the, the, the first sensuousness would have been in holding hands or touching hands. And so I focus on that aspect. And so it's showing up here again that holding hands is so important, uh, um, just touching. Um, it, it's, I, know, I know that here in the present day and time now that such a thing is extremely sensuous to me personally and so I just imagine this may be a way that um, intimacy may have evolved I don't know <laughs> oh, and I thought you were talking about love and and joy being greater than uh, fear and the need to all the other evolutionary things they talk about yeah could be <laughs> okay let's go let's keep going did you have another one to pop up um I, only, I have another one that I want to share, at least in part, just to demonstrate the, um, to demonstrate the idea of rhyme. Let me see if I can, this, this poem, can you see that? Is, because I, my screen is messed up. Uh, we're still seeing the, the previous standing up. Okay, I, got, I got to do something. I got to get your image back. Yeah, then, you're gonna have to exit full screen, I think. I don't know. Let me see. I got I got you a little screen. Uh, okay, new share. This will work. And this is the one. This piece was just accepted last week um, by Red Coyote Journal, and um, it's the title poem of my collection on Native American infused poetry. Okay, and let's hear it. Redactions, but there are, there are, there are poems that have been influenced by Native American culture and legend and history. And this poem here is, the whole collection is called the uh, Sacred Flute. So this is the poem about, about the flute, the legend of the flute, which comes from the Sioux. And um, and the Siatanka is a flute only for love music to a winchinchala, a girl to fall in love with. And so what I've done is, is I've taken the legend, I've compressed it, I've, I've introduced some uh, rhyme, and I'll point it out now because that's the point of this poem is to show you how I do the rhyme. It's in A-A-B. C okay. D. Okay, so the first two lines of the of the tercet rhyme very softly, very uh, very slanted. Many generations ago, my people played drums, gourd rattles, and bull roarers, but no flutes. Night came deep inside of thick woods with no moon, full of haunting hoots and the groaning of trees in the wind. Then a new sound mournful ghostly sad but beautiful a young hunter mostly had a dream of a red-headed bird and it goes on like that um because the poem is a little long so i don't want to take too much time reading it but it gives the whole legend and you can see by just looking down how my rhymes are um like man and then see that's a that's a really slanted line yeah uh, and and the, and what's even more slanted is the next one down and became that's that's really stretching a rhyme, but some of them like leaves and trees at least the it's, it's assonantal rhyme the the vowels are rhyming e the e sound, sure. but some of the rhymes in here are hard as well like wood and stood, so I'm not opposed to hard rhymes it's just that I don't want to draw attention to the poem by having too many of them. And um, and if they have to sound natural, so the line doesn't. I don't stop at the end of the line. It continues to read often. 
most of these. So, so that the, if you're not looking at it, it'll it'll hear like natural internal rhymes to you, and I like that. That's 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 what I like. Anyway. Well, I can see. Before you, let's look at right where your cursor is. There, there's a. I'm just grabbed a, a stanza out of. It says he took the hollowed piece of wood back to his village and stood in a holy place to purify himself. So in the first line of that, I see took and wood. Mm -hmm. That's a, a linear rhyme there. It's not in rhyme, but took yeah. wood. And then and that a lot on the. You have place and purify or alliteration. Correct. Holy place to purify. And so part of the poetic beauty, I think, well, what I call it is wordplay. And that may be an insult to someone, but there's a, a sense that our words and our sounds, uh, a poet... <laughs> Anyone could stand there and, and just say, well, let me tell you the history of this thing. But something about poetry, it's that wordplay that we hear the music in the words. Yes. That in a way that uh, makes it fascinating to our ears. Let's, uh, is there any more from this one you want to read? I bet we could w look through it and find some examples of... Um. No, I, I got a, I got other work that I can share that not necessarily rhyming work, but it'll have that sure. it'll have that internal sonics though. All, all my work yeah. will have the internal sonics because that that's that's that like you use the word that's the same word that's on my website. The music of words, the art of poetry, the music of words, and so. How do you choose the length of your lines? Let's look at this. All right. They're all similar lengths. I, yes. I'm not counting the syllables or the feet, uh, but they're very similar. And what makes you then want to break the end of the line there and go on to a new line? Yeah. Well, okay. That's a good question. Um, I, and I'm not sure which. I'm not sure what particular line or verse this occurred in. But oftentimes, somewhere in the early draft of my poem there'll be a line break that is grabs my attention and yeah. so uh that when that happens that often will set the line length for me and and um of course you can't always make it work so i have to be i have to do other creative things like starting to use indented lines to to in order to achieve the uniformity that i'm looking for but more than likely um, it was it was that reason um, that that was one of the reasons that factored into the line length. The other thing is that when you tell a story, I think of the ballot form. This is not a ballot form at all. The ballot form are are, are quatrains, four lines, with um, with the second and fourth um, verses rhyming, but they're typically iambic. Um, heptameter well the the first lines are 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 iambic iambic tetrameter the next lines iambic hexameter and then it goes back to iambic hep uh tetrameter and then iambic in other words eight or six syllables per line seems to be very convenient for storytelling as opposed to say 10 syllables though that can work too but i wouldn't go beyond that so just for giggles how many syllables are on an average line here Many generations ago, my people, all right, 11, <laughs> uh, played drums, gourd rattles, and bull. So at seven, uh, the night came deep inside a thick woods. Eight, with no moon, full of haunting hoots. Eight. So I would, I would guess that the average line length uh, on, the, on the, cup, the couplets, are going to be about eight syllables. Uh, the The third lines often are shortened, and maybe that's just because of the way the rhythm seemed to work with the rhyme scheme that I chose. And I don't know. When I write, I write, I read out loud as I'm writing sometimes, and I don't wait until I'm in the deep into the revision process to check to see if I like the sound of it. I'm. It's. It's kind of like. It's that. I, I'll, I allow that during my creation process as well as my revision process. I'm, 
the sound is is important to me so i'm reading out loud as i'm typing or um scribbling or whatever i'm however the poem gets written first so if this was in prose all these lines would just be strung across the page to the margins and but when we sing a song like any modern song we we put it in verse because we repeat a short line and often there is patterns to each line yes and um so poetry and music are this are very similar in that sense i mean they're yes so so i guess i guess one of the things you can take away from from this part of the discussion is that you don't have to have meter and rhyme in order to in order to have rhythm uh, the flow of the words can be very appealing but yet not be uh legalistic or regimented um, uh, like a soldier's march like okay. the example that i give often is just imagine yourself at the at a at, a, at the beach at the ocean beach where you're watching the the waves come in and there's, it's very soothing, but yet if you count, but if you look carefully, you'll see that they're they're not exactly regular. There is variation on the timing of the waves. There, there. So, so that's the way with um, when I write poetry, the, the the metrical content of my work might accidentally be iambic, pentameter or something, because most of human speech is iambic anyway. But it's not, it's not contrived or, or it, I don't deliberately try to maintain the same meter throughout the whole poem but I will try to maintain a particular meter for a short section if I if I want to drive home a point like that that iambic that 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 uh, uh, anapestic tetrameter um, da -da doom da -da doom da -da doom can be used to 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 um, uh, what do you call it? In one of my poems, I use it to, to to give to give the impression of power surging, you know, like the horses. But in this in this particular instance, it was a it was a space engine, and um, and so I deliberately wrote anapestic tetrameter in that that particular verse only to drive home that point. And what's so cool about the anapest is that it it delves right nicely with the I am, which is natural. Da doom, da doom, da da doom, da doom, da doom, da da doom. You see how the I am and the Anapest can mix together so well. I don't think of these things when I'm writing. They just happen naturally. Only in my post-writing analysis on my work do I notice some of these things. Maybe in a later revision, I said, ah, I can take advantage of that, and then I'll tweak it to, to fine-tune it like that. But in, in first draft, that may or may not be there. And, and okay, yeah. so I want to ask you to let's talk about that more about your process. Maybe what starts as inspiration and then the technical part. Tell sure. us about. I don't know if you want to use this poem as an example, oh, but in general, I'm, I'm sorry. I just I just closed. It. <laughs> it's okay. I just want to talk to you for a minute now. Uh, uh, this is great. So in general. Uh, what do you think of the concept of inspiration versus hard work? What's your process like? <laughs> um, it's all hard work, <laughs> but I very much believe in inspiration too. And the truth of it is, and I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm now, <laughs> I guess I'm going to confessional time. <laughs> Back in the early days, um, um, and this would be 2004, 2005. That neck of the woods. Um, when I when I sit at my desk or the table, wherever I'm, I want to start writing. Okay, everything, every I'm I'm in the right mood. Um, I'm ready. I want to write a poem, and the pen's in my hand and poised literally on the paper, and I'm just my head's down and I'm going, okay, Lord, any time. I'm ready. <laughs> I wanted to be struck by that inspiration. <laughs> well, I waited a long time. And to add, to add uh, since I'm confessing things, I might as well confess one more. 
uh, you're familiar with KB's um, open mic at the Barnes and Noble on yeah. last Friday. All right. Well, in the beginning, again, 05 for me, and uh, this is when I discovered it. And I these these uh, list these list of words that are solicited from which we are to write a poem or whatever for the following month. I thought was I was not I was not happy about it. I thought it was contrived. I thought it was artificial. I thought it was I poo pooed it and I was vocal about it. But I tell you right now, I've already repented numerous times because the truth of it is. Almost every time I write a poem like that, it gets published after revision. So it's a very, very powerful tool to use to um, to write something. This a list of words. And why? Because as you look, as you read the words or or say them out loud, um, even the adjacent words, but not necessarily even adjacent. But there's there's a connection that's made to an event or an experience from which. It's, it's almost like an aha moment. And then all the other words will start just feeding into that particular concept. And so as KB puts it, it's, it's good for, instead of looking at a blank screen, a blank page rather, that you have these words to help trigger the creative process. So I'm a very, I used to be a poo pooer, but now, now that I'm matured as a poet, um, and long before I matured as a poet, I realized the value of all prompts. So my source of inspiration, <clears throat> inspiration is all, and it's all God derived, I know, but it's, I mean, something to, to, to connect to my past experience, whether it be a list of mm -hmm. words or uh, an abiding image as I'm driving down the road or a piece of music or something, um, something all around us. All we have to do is observe. And and not have an agenda of well I, I have to, I hear there's a bird on the wire do I have to write a poem that's got to be a poem in there well maybe there is but if you don't look too hard if you just relax those things will naturally happen you know okay so we've just got a couple minutes left so let me finish by asking them maybe you already answered it about what tip would you give to uh, as aspiring or novice writers to help us um, maybe take that next step? What Give us some tips about how to improve our poetry. Yeah, d don't beat yourself up, number one, about writing it. A lot, of the po a lot of the really good poems that we read that have been published or in compendiums or anthologies, whatever, those works have been, they weren't born that way. They were, they were, when they were birthed, they, they may have been um, okay, they may have been even junk. Um, not, not likely junk, but, 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 but not publishable. But after some time, which may be weeks to years, in rare occasions is much sooner, um, then they get published. So when a novice looks at a published work, they say how, how good it is. They say, well, I, I can't write like that. No, most of us can't produce something like that from the get-go. It, it, you give it birth, and then let your left brain kick in with all the skills of crafting the poem. So my advice is, don't beat yourself up, um, and then keep in mind the major elements. I've distilled it all down to four big, broad things. Of course, emotion to to to, to drive emotion is a is a desired end product, but but, but the ingredients for the poem. LIMS, L-I-M-S is my acronym. L is for language. I is for image, which means all sensory images. M is for music. And S is for structure. And they all not only work, uh, not only are they contributing elements, but what really makes a poem sing, so to speak, is when all these elements work together, you have a synergistic effect. And so um, just keep in mind about the interplay don't don't force words and don't force a round word into a square box you know just just and don't worry about creating a masterpiece from the beginning that will come huh sweet all righty well uh i think we're gonna have to do this again i i i want to cut us finish for night and thank you john very much for your time and uh 
I hope the guild members will take advantage of this uh, interview. And uh, I don't know how to end these. This is uh, my first time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Take care. I'm going to end this right now. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye.